Welcome to the first webinar of 2015. So Happy New Year to everybody. We are kicking this off right. It may be cold where I am. It's actually negative two. But in Salesforce world, it is spring. So yay for us. The four amazing people that we have on this webinar, of course, my name is Mike Gerhold. I am admin evangelist at Salesforce. We have a huge lineup of people. I'm so excited, honored to be with these great, intelligent 2015 hosts. Bill Takis, Director of Product Management, will talk to uh, Salesforce admins and developers about visual workflow. You can tweet at him at SFDC Bill. Uh, Adam Torman and Josh Kaplan will join together, tag team, on all of the amazing features for developers that are coming in Spring 15. You can tweet at Adam at A Torman and Josh is at Josh SFDC. So please, please, please tweet at them. And of course, since we're talking spring, it wouldn't be 2015 if we didn't start off the webinar without a safe harbor slide. So uh, basically what this slide says is please make all purchasing decisions based on current functionality and not any forward-looking statements that we probably will make during this webinar. This is a long slide. You can go to salesforce.com and search on Safe Harbor if you'd like to read it in your spare time. It's pretty fun. As I mentioned, our Twitter handles, we are very social for this webinar, so please follow us at Salesforce Devs. Uh, and if you want to tweet all the amazing features that you see today and make your friends jealous about the webinar you are watching, use the hashtag ForceWebinar. Uh, of course, if you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Google+, we are there as well. Just look for Salesforce Developers. And while you're tweeting, we just want to remind you this webinar is being recorded. Yay! because it's going to be an amazing webinar. So the cool part about it is the recap page will be the same URL that you used to register. So keep that URL handy. And of course, we will post it to YouTube. Give us a little bit of time. There's a lot of awesomeness to capture in this webinar. So with that being said, we do have a little bit of housekeeping on top of the safe harbor statement. Want to talk about questions. We know you're going to have questions because we're going to talk about a lot of amazing features. So please do not wait until the end to ask your question. We have experts standing by who can answer them immediately or as close to immediately as possible. We do our best. Uh, please respect the Q&A etiquette, i.e. please don't try to repeat questions. We've got a team that's going to go through and we want to make sure we get every question answered. So before you ask, it's always best to look and see if that question has been asked previously. But do stick around. There will be live Q&A at the end, which is always fun. Uh, we will take some questions that you have asked and have our presenters answer them live. And of course, we do our best to answer every question during these webinars. But if there's something that's just bugging you that you need to get more support on, please visit developer.salesforce.com backslash forums and you can join our amazing community who will help you answer for all of those questions. So what does our agenda look like for today? Well, we're gonna do two parts to this webinar and we want everybody to stick around, mostly because there's Q&A and Adam Torman at the end. But the first half is Spring 15 for Salesforce admins. So we've got a really great overview of some admin features and a special guest demo. I'm not gonna tell you who. It's going to be cool. Salesforce admins are going to see something amazing. And you know what, developers? This doesn't give you the first 30 minutes free because there's a lot of declarative tools that will help you get your job done faster. Now, the second half, we've got Adam Torman and Josh who are going to talk about all the amazing stuff for Salesforce developers, including a pilot programs update. Holy cow, there are some cool things that are coming your way in the second half, not to mention live Q&A. So with that, that's our agenda for the next hour or so. As promised in the agenda, we will kick it off with Spring 15 highlights for Salesforce admins. So the first thing I want to highlight uh, that's coming in Spring 15, you saw it at Dreamforce, you saw it at the admin keynote, it was demoed. Duplicate management is here. I'll pause momentarily for the applause. But you know, as a Salesforce admin, you get tons of requests to clean data, and there's a lot of fabulous partners out there who can help you clean your data as well as just 
uh, visually doing it yourself. Now you can actually set up in Spring 15 duplicate matching rules for accounts, leads, and contacts. So notice this is a really neat feature that I like as a Salesforce admin. And it's also, as you can see, we've got pictured the alerts work on Salesforce One because your users were entering things on the laptop and on the desktop as well. So duplicate management, I am excited about this. And in case you're a Salesforce awesome admin superhero, we have our super deduper who is, uh, <laughs> yes. And who Mike, is bringing, Mike, this was... ushering, ushering this feature in. Yes, Adam. This was like the, the like the number one most voted on idea on the idea exchange for how many it's, years? It's, it's massive. Taking this idea down, it, it, it's it's huge burden off the idea exchange. It's going to get so much faster now because we don't have to hold on to this idea. So yes, right. it was it had thousands, hundreds of thousands of points. So it shows you the power of that idea exchange. It's incredible. Post your ideas. There's some that just went out today that are amazing, and we listen. And we create superheroes to help you be successful. Now, the second one, uh, if you've been a Salesforce admin for a day or two, you've probably had your salespeople come up to you and say, it'd be really cool if we had a visualization that helped us understand where we are in the sales process. I know as an admin, I got this request a ton. And short of jumping the code, which, you know, then I'd have to email Adam Torman, uh, I, I didn't have a solution, but Spring 15 comes out and we have something new called Sales Path. So a Sales Path, you can actually help drive Salesforce One adoption because it's available on the mobile device. And what it does, it's a simple visual graphic that you as an admin can set up so you can mirror your steps in the sales process. In addition, you can also provide links to chatter posts. You can provide helpful information, best practices, potential pitfalls at a certain sales stage. And the one thing that I like best is you can also give your salespeople at that particular stage some words of encouragement. A so a sales always, always be closing. closing. Absolutely. So you could also buy some steak knives to roll out with sales path, right? Because then all of your salespeople are going to be superstars and they'll need steak knives. It's a Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross thing. You can Google it. So we've got sales path coming out. We've got duplicate management coming out. Hmm. What do we have for the service side of the house? Well, on service, I'm really excited for the Social customer service getting started pack. I think this is one thing I know as an admin I was asked for a lot was we have a call center, we have a group of people that are very active and watch our brand on Facebook or on Twitter and they're responding, but we would also like to capture that information in Salesforce. And with the getting started with social customer service pack, you can actually connect up to two accounts. So you can connect a Facebook and a Twitter account or two Facebook accounts or two Twitter accounts, and your agents can actually favorite tweets, tweets and posts. So you're starting to get into that 360 degree view of the customer now with the customer service getting started pack. The cool thing about this is it uses our Radian 6 technology, but it doesn't require a Radian 6 contract. So if this works in your organization, you want to go to the next level, getting into Radian 6 is super, super easy. So those are the three amazing features that I am so excited about. But the one big thing that Bill is going to talk to us about is process automation. And he has a special guest standing by. So I'm going to throw this over to Bill, and we'll talk about process automation. Thank you, Michael. So let's talk about Process Builder. Go ahead and hit next. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, Process Builder Well GA in, with the Spring 15 release. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> for those of you that don't know, Process Builder is our next generation of workflow tool. Um, you can actually back up a slide. Hang on a second. Yep, that was accidental click. No worries. I and got click is, happy. I got it, click happy. It, it's easy to be happy with Process Builder. Because it's clicks, not code. It is. Correct. And it is built on our platform. We leverage both Visual Workflow as well as Lightning Technologies to build um, Process Builder. 
So Process Builder will enable more people across your organization to automate their businesses and do it faster. It's easy to use because it gives you a picture of the process you're building as you build it and it puts the power of code in your hands with just a few clicks. It's simple enough for admins and also business analysts so you can radically improve your efficiency. Let's go to the next slide. Advancing, advancing, maybe. There we go. So you can think of Process Builder as workflow rules plus actions. It's a great way to think about it. And it really enables you to operate across objects and you can combine rules in a single process. You can think of having multiple if-then statements. It says that if a criteria is met, do these actions, et cetera, et cetera. And you can string these together. And like I, we mentioned on the first slide, you have a graphical interface to build these processes so you can see sort of what's happening. Not, not visual workflow yet. Yep, I know. There's a ghost in the machine. I no worries. So there are some, uh, some key features that are worth mentioning about um, Process Builder. So you can have, as I mentioned, multiple criteria slash rules combined into one process. You can have versions around your processes now. You have flexibility to operate on any related uh, record. Powerful new actions include the ability to create a record, chatter posts including field references, topics, and app mentions. You can submit for approval. You can trigger visual workflows. You, you can fire quick actions and even trigger Apex, all without having to write code. So again, all available with clicks, not code. Lots of power in Process Builder. Let's go to the next slide. Before we bring on our guest, also talk briefly about what's in Visual Workflow for Spring 15. So the first thing that's, um, that we've built is the ability to start and stop a flow, pause and resume a flow. A good use case example here is if you have a call center, you have agents filling out a form, a customer calls in, doesn't have all the information that they need to complete the form or the process, the agent will be able to pause the flow and resume the flow when the, when the caller calls back in or the customer calls back in. We've also enabled conditional logic um, in decisions and formulas and assignments. So instead of just having all and or all ors, you can now have and, ands and ors um, to build conditional logic in a flow. We've added some new management tools to help you manage your flows in flight. So one of the key ones is being able to put a, an interview label or a label for each running version of a flow. So you can clearly understand what flow belongs to what customer or what flow belongs to what process. You can also now invoke Apex from a flow. There's an Apex action. It will supersede the process plugin. We used to be able to use uh, Apex, but Right now, it's all about being able to execute Apex from an action. And then we have a pilot coming up. There'll be more information available about this pilot shortly, but we've built the ability to launch a flow from Salesforce One. So you can think about being on, the con on an account record. There'll be a button down in the action bar down the bottom that will be able to launch a flow. And so that's sort of the wrap up on um, Process Builder and Visual Workflow. I want to introduce Shelly Ersig, who is the product manager for Process Builder. She's actually going to demo Process Builder for you now. Shelly? Thanks, Bill. All Thanks, right. everyone. Bear with me here while we just flip to. Flipping. Flipping. OK. Wait until that shows up. Great. I'm super excited to demo this uh, for you. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, oh, we are not oh, showing the streams. This is not share. Yeah. We're not changing presenter. Oops. Uh, I got nothing here. I think that's that one's not shared. Oh, it's still Mike. Oh, whoops. Okay. Hey, Mike. Sorry. You're in control there. Uh, we're, I'm actually on Bill's laptop. Sorry, folks. We're in about five different locations. Uh, bringing this to you, obviously, really live. I will switch that. 
No worries. Get the Bill's laptop. And hey, hey, there we go. All right, let's straighten that out. We'll be back in business. Okay, do that. That looks a little better. Great. All right, okay. now we're cooking okay. with Crisco. All right. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. All right, so Process Builder, where do you find it? Let's start with that. So if you go to Setup and you scroll down, and you click Create, under Workflow and Approvals, you will see Process Builder. Click on Process Builder. This is your Process Builder management page. So this is where you will see the list of all of your processes. It will give you the name of the process, show you which object that process is on the last time you modified it, and the status. And we've got something over here called Manage Versions. So let's take a look at that. We allow you to have multiple versions of the same process so that you can make changes while processes are running, uh, and then quickly swap, swap out the different versions, activate and deactivate automatically. And so here you can manage that. And it also gives you the description and the, uh, and the last date you modified. And if you click on the version name, you can go in and drill in and take a look at that version. So let's actually um, take a look at what it is like to start a new process. And I'm going to call this Webinar Opti Management. And we're going to, if you just click in API name, that's a developer name, uh, that will automatically populate for you. You can have a description that you can add. I'm going to hit, go ahead and click OK and just give you a tour. So as you can see, we've mapped out, we've sort of sketched out all the steps you need to take in order to make a process. But the only step that is active is the next step you need to take. And so in this way, we sort of guide you um, in building a process. So the first step you take is, is uh, you say, which object do you want this process on? And in this case, I'm going to say we're going to do some opportunity management. So I'm going to click the opportunity type record, do some settings, hit save. And now this becomes active. So you'll see the next active thing is criteria. So now I need to tell this process when I want the process to fire. And I've got a number of choices and some new things uh, that you didn't have in workflow rules. First thing I'm going to do is give this a name. I'm going to want to fire this when the opportunity stage is closed one. So actually, maybe I'll just call this closed one. And I'm going to use a filter condition. But before I do that, uh, I just want to point out you can use a formula. Or we've heard from a lot of you that you're, you're rigging up uh, funky little formulas in order just to make the thing fire every time. So we've given you this selection here that says, don't apply any criteria. Just execute the associated actions. So I'm going to go back up to the filter, choose that selection. And I can add any number of, of fields down here. But I'm just going to choose one. And we're going to say stage. So I want to set this up so that when the opportunity stage equals, I go over here and I find my pick list, closed one, that's when I want this to fire. So now I hit save. And now you'll notice I can now add actions. I can also continue to sketch out my process and add more criteria. So Bill mentioned earlier that you can have essentially multiple rules in a single process. Each of these criteria and its accompanying actions is essentially the equivalent of a workflow rule. So I could continue on and say, uh, for the next criteria, close lost and then another one prospecting and on and on so that I can manage my entire sort of opportunity sales cycle here in one process rather than having dozens and dozens of rules. So let's take a look at the actions. I click add action and then I can see all the actions. Bill mentioned a few of these. I can, I can call Apex. If someone's written an Apex class and that's in my org, I can create a record of any type. I can send email alerts launch a flow. I can post to chatter. And those posts can include field references from the records that I'm working with. can also include at mentions and uh, topics. If you've got customized quick actions in your org, you can, you can choose what to fire off and connect one of those to your process. You can also submit records for approval and do field updates on records. So let's back out of this 
and take a quick look at a very small but powerful process that we've already built. This is called address change. Now, what this process does, it's on account. Anytime the billing street is changed, I've got an action here that updates all the contact addresses. Mail, it maps all the fields from the parent account and maps all those fields to the uh, address, uh, address fields in the contacts. Now, this is pretty powerful. This took about six minutes to build. And if you look here, we've got all these contacts from Burlington Textiles Corp. America. So let's make a change to that address. Very right, quickly. Instead of Lexington Avenue, let's call this 762 Main Street. Great. Hit save. And now I'm going to go back and refresh those contacts. And we'll see that that change has percolated all the way down uh, to all the associated contacts. So it's a very, so in this very, very small uh, process that I built, it took really literally about six minutes. Um, I'm now making sure that all of my data, when there are changes made, is current and up to date and accurate. So that's just a quick look at a little bit of what the process builder can do. You can find out more uh, by checking out the release notes and all the accompanying documentation. The process builder is GA, <laughs> this spring 15 release, and it's available in all UE, EE, performance, and DE editions. So check it out. Now we're going to pass this back off to Adam Torman and Josh Kaplan. They've got a host of exciting things for developers. So bear with us here while we switch locations. And tee up Josh and Adam. All right. Thanks, Shelley. While we're getting the slides up and running, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Torman. And uh, Josh and I are really excited to talk about some very cool things coming out with the Spring 15 release. In fact, uh, there were really so many features coming out. If you look at the, the release notes, there's like uh, 50, 60 pages just of all these great iterations within just the developer track that it's really worth checking out. Uh, and the first part here that we're going to really dig into is taking a look at a series of uh, API-first developer-based features that are built on an exciting new technology that we're starting to roll out with big data. Uh, let's see. Hopefully, right there we go. Right. Fantastic. Hopefully, uh, everyone can see my developer slide right now. Uh, nice and blank, just developer. But really, to, to hit home, this first set of features is really about developers building incredible visualizations on top of an incredibly robust API, digging down not into hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of records, but millions and, dare I say, even billions of records. Uh, so the first feature i like to talk about is a feature that's coming out in Pilot in the spring release. It's the ability in near real time to query out login information and be able to get uh, automated roll-up aggregates on an hourly basis so that you can start to determine who your users are that are logging in into the service. And this is pretty incredible because this is API first. Mike and I have talked at length about uh, the notion of API versus UI and why API first is so important. It is such an important part of how we design all of our features here at Salesforce. Uh, and what this feature gives us the ability to do is really dig in to uh, API tools like Sockle that give us the ability to query things like accounts and leads and contacts. But now also the same way we would query those CRM-based objects, we can now query these big objects, these HBase backed objects to return back enormous amounts of data. So just to give you a quick example of this, I'm looking at our Workbench tool. The Workbench tool is kind of like Data Loader, only in the cloud. Uh, I love this tool because it helps me as a developer to understand schema and execute to Apex and, and migrate Meta API. But in this capacity, all I'm doing is looking at a SQL query. 
And this SQL query, this is, again, just like any other object in our S object hierarchy, just like accounts or leads. This is a new object we're introducing in the Spring 15 release called Login Events. And Login Events gives us the ability to query information about a user every single time they log in whether it's their API that they're logging in through or a particular application or browser or client version. Uh, and really the power of this SQL is that it allows us to drill down into information about our users. And we use this raw event stream data, which gets to be quite large actually, to roll up into hourly aggregate metrics that we call platform event metrics. And again, these things are accessible via the exact same SQL query engine that you've grown to to love here. So all I'm doing is pulling back some information about my metric time, my type, and my value from this object based on a specific canned metric called number of logins. Now what's really powerful about this is because it's exposed first to the API, you can build amazing visualizations off it. So this is an example of a visual force page with Google Analytics, and all I'm doing is passing uh, JavaScript remoting calls so I can pull back those roll-up aggregate metrics, and now I can start to derive a, a series of baseline behaviors. For instance, over a period of time, tell me what my, uh, tell me what my values are for my number of logins. But then also, on a per-user basis, tell me those logins, and then per IP address per user, and per browser per user, and applications per user, and all of a sudden we create this baseline. Now where this is incredibly powerful is for compliance and audit use cases and security use cases, where I want to be able to disambiguate when Adam Torman's logging in uh, legitimately versus when uh, it's the doppelganger Adam Torman logging in from a suspicious tower somewhere in Shanghai in the middle of the night. So that's the first of these big data features. As we continue down the road, a feature that we've had actually all nine years that I've been at Salesforce, field history tracking, is about to go through a fundamental shift with a, the announcement of the generally available field audit trail feature. Now what's kind of cool about this is if you think about it, field history tracking, that ability to track changes on a column level where we can see the old value and the new value, all of a sudden it grows and grows and grows to the point that you have hundreds of millions of rows of data. And this can have huge impacts when we talk about how we use the underlying database because certain processes take a long time when you have to traverse that many rows of data. So we're starting to use big data to archive some of this off so that's still accessible using the API and SQL, which is ideal for a developer to build applications around, whereas the more recent field history changes will continue to keep an oracle. And all this will be declarative policy-driven retention. So you'll still have access to that live field history tracking, and you'll have the ability to determine when you archive that off so that you make things faster, easier, uh, better on Oracle uh, while you still maintain access to that archived data. So all that history is going to initially go into something we call entity history, and it's going to live there for up to 18 months but then you can create these declarative policies to determine how long you want to retain it in Oracle versus when you want to actually push it over to HBase and archive it. Uh, and customers who have even more aggressive retention policies might choose to push up the number of field history tracking um, uh, watches that they have in place so that they can archive more readily and more quickly. Uh, what's interesting here is also, for the longest time, actually for the nine years that this feature has been out, you've been limited to 20 fields that you could use for field history tracking. Because of field audit trail and the, our ability to now extend to the hundreds of millions and billion row scenario, we can now start to extend that beyond 20 fields. But it's important to understand that you will need to use field audit trail to extend beyond those 20 fields. All right. So uh, the way this works is very simple. Once we archive the data, whether it be account history, case history, contact history, lead history, opportunity, or custom objects, all of it will be accessible via that same SQL and API that you use on a daily basis. You'll have a new object called Field History Archive, where you can pull out that archived field name, its parent, its timestamp, to start to get a better idea of what your actual archive look, data looks like. Um, what I find kind of interesting about this feature is 
uh, it really does make things just work more smoothly in your organization because what you're doing is basically an archive and purge. And oftentimes archive and purge means you put something into a vault and you never ever touch it. But the way we built this, this is highly accessible for developers through API and Sockle. So normally what you would do is you'd come here to Opportunity Fields, for instance, and you'd set the history tracking, and you'd determine which of those fields you actually want to track history on. But you've been limited to 20 fields so far. So, for, so that we can increase that beyond that 20 field limit, where you can actually see changes in things like the description or particular field values, we've gone ahead and we've made it possible to archive that data off. So for instance, in looking at the API, and this has been accessible via the API for the longest time, you would normally go to the opportunity field history and you'd write a SQL query to pull back that data. And that's only being pulled back from our S object and from Oracle. But now with Spring 15 and the GA of this feature, there's a new S object here called field history archive. And this is actually residing on HBase. And because it is, we can put lots and lots of data there, and you still have that same level of accessibility through the API that you do through the normal S object, opportunity field history, or account field history, or any of the, the other uh, ways we've tracked field history to date. So this is, we're really excited to announce Field Audit Trail because it really does extend your ability to archive data and play with large data sets in an accessible manner that isn't vaulted off into cold storage. So what you will get with the GA is the standard offering, 20 fields uh, per object with a retention policy that defaults only to 18 months. If you want to have more fields or extend that retention up to 10 years, you will need the field audit trail add-on. All right. Well, with that, there's some really cool program, pilot programs that have finally grown up. Josh, can you tell us about where we are with these pilot programs? Yes, yes, I can. Thanks, Adam. So, Spring, Spring 15 release is a marks a coming of age for a lot of a lot of different pilot programs that we've been working on for quite a long time. Uh, they grow up so fast. They grow up faster than my actual kids. That's 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 for sure. I saw uh, pictures of them when they were in pilot. Nice. Uh, they uh, different pilot programs we've been working on for a while. They're now available. You see listed here. Uh, we'll talk about them. the first one here is asynchronous callouts. This is a uh, feature that allows you to scale up a service center type of application that needs to integrate to an existing back-end service. We have a long-running transaction limit. If you have callouts that take a long time, you're not able to scale up a service center beyond 10 concurrent users. This feature allows you to go beyond that to, I don't know if we have a theoretical maximum on this, but we're working with some pretty large service centers who are now able to integrate existing assets into a Visual Force user interface. So this represents a, uh, a true integration of existing services and the cloud uh, all through all through the cloud. The next item is FlexQ. FlexQ is a, an iteration on Batch Apex, where in the past you've had a limit to the number of jobs you could run at a time. That limit has been dramatically increased. You can now run, uh, I think, up to 100. You have 100 jobs in queued at a time. And while they're waiting to run, you have some control over the order in which they execute. So you will not be in a situation where you're running some low priority process and you're blocked from running something that's uh, extremely urgent or extremely high priority. You're able to shuffle the order in which the jobs that are waiting to run are going to run. We're going to put more into this as we move forward, but for now, we've dramatically increased the limits and we've given you more power over the queue. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the next one right now. Uh, the arrow should be pointing down to lightning components, but it's pointing to quick deploys. So and I'll go back. Uh, lightning components are uh, give you the Sorry. ability to create user interfaces uh, like Visual Force that look like our Salesforce user interface. But now I'm talking about the Salesforce One mobile user interface. And you've probably heard uh, lots about this in the past few months. If you were at Dreamforce or have watched any of the content from that or since, lightning components are uh, the the same components that we use to build our mobile application, and we're making them available to you to build your own user interface uh, applications that can go drop right into Salesforce One and look uh, like they're seamlessly built as part of the, the main application. This is an extension of what we did with Visual Force, where the components uh, were designed to look like the standard Salesforce UI. These components are designed to look like the Salesforce One UI. So you are now able to build applications that look like you're part of our team. 
Moving on to the next pilot program, branch orgs. This is uh, going to become a pilot program, this release. ISVs on the, on the call, you're probably very excited about this. Today's world, the ISV has a uploading org that has the namespace on it, and that namespace is the unique identifier for, the, for that particular package. But to develop things for that package, you have to build a developer edition org in a developer edition org that has no namespace. Now, we've done a lot to make sure that the transition from that no namespace org to the namespace org is actually relatively painless, but there are some painful parts to it. There are some things that need to be massaged, like queries and you know, direct uh, access to different types of fields. These things are going to be uh, smoothed over with branch orgs. Branch orgs are a developer edition org that shares the namespace with your packaging org. They're going to be created directly from the packaging org, as you can see in this user interface here. Uh, you can click new and it will spin up a DE org that has the namespace of your, uh, of your parent. So the development that you do there is now going to fit much more seamlessly back into your upload org. So this will make ISV development significantly more efficient. And I think next we turn it back over to you, Mr. Torman. Thank you very much, Josh. So, you know, we're really excited. I've been talking about big data and how we're starting to roll out this whole new host of technologies to really extend to the billion row case. And one of those technologies built on top of uh, an open source project called Hadoop and a scripting language called Pig, which is also open source, is data pipelines. And data pipelines will be in pilot with the Spring 15 release. Uh, this is really cool because it gives us the ability to do massive parallel processing that's massive across all sorts of different kinds of data within the force.com platform. From S objects like accounts, contacts, and custom objects, it includes the ability to ingest and transform Salesforce files like chatter files or monitoring logs. Uh, big objects, which are like uh, field history archive built on top of HBase, as well as the new platform connect external objects like purchase history and SAP. So this becomes a single place to do massive transformation of data. So to give a quick example of how this looks and what this looks like, let me resume here. Uh, you'll notice I'm looking at our force.com console. Right, this is built on top of our tooling API, and one of the new things you'll see with this pilot is a data pipelines tab and the ability to actually load and create new pipelines. Right? So this is deployed through the metadata API, and uh, if you've ever written PIG before, pretty straightforward. Um, all we're doing is wrapping around our SQL API. So for instance, I create my contacts here, I load in a SQL query of data using the bulk API, where I'm pulling back ID, name, account ID, email, and contact. Once I have that, all I'm going to do is pull that out of my S object and put it into a Salesforce file in the form of a CSV. So I store those contacts into Chatter, into a contact store, which actually represents a Chatter file. So once I submit this data pipeline and it goes ahead and processes on our Hadoop Grid Force server, what I'll see within Chatter Files is an actual file with this data. And when I parse that data, I'll see is my contact store here with all my IDs, names, and email addresses. All right. Mm -hmm. One of the other cool things about this feature is that it's not just about producing an output that's in CSV or producing an output into an S object or a big object. It also gives you the ability through a UDF, custom UDF, user-defined function, to create Salesforce Wave data sets. So another example I, I have here is my, this is a rather large data pipeline. It pulls in assets, products, app users, opportunities, as well as Salesforce files. It joins and iterates over those different data sources, and then it stores it into a series of files, and then from those files, it actually generates data within an S object that I've created called product distribution. And once I have that S object, I can then bring that into Salesforce Wave using a Salesforce Wave workflow, and now I have the ability to report on it. So here's a great way to combine a cool developer feature, uh, Salesforce Data Pipelines, and Salesforce Wave to get a visualiz visualization engine built on top of that data. <coughs> 
All right. Well, just as an example, our data pipeline code that I just showed you looks at things like contacts, how I can load them, and then store them back into a chatter file. All right. Well, there's some other really cool things around the application lifecycle management space. Josh, tell us about the making deployments faster. We've listened to you. We've listened to the voice of the customer. You have, you've told us a lot, frequently, repeatedly, that you'd like deployments to be faster. Uh, everything, we want everything to be faster, right? The only thing we don't want faster is how fast I talk. That should be slower. But everything else, faster. Making deployments faster, we have two features coming out in spring release that are going to help. Uh, first steps, we've got lots more coming behind this, but these are the first uh, things you're going to see towards making new deployments uh, from one order to another faster. So the first one is called Quick Deploy. Typically, you're going to have two different orgs. You're going to have your source, which is going to be either your sandbox or a DE org, uh, which you're going to be doing your development in. And then you've got a destination org, which is either your production system or if you're an ISV, it's going to be your, your, your upload packaging org. And you want to get stuff from the source where you're doing the development and you want to migrate that into your production org. First step you're going to do is you're going to do a, hey, Adam, give me a thank you, deploy yep. validate. The deploy validate step is not an actual deployment. It's just validating that the deployment itself is going to be valid when we do it. This is something you can do today, uh, but it's now integrated into a new process. So what happens is, first we're creating an, an artifact that we're going to deploy. This is the changes you made. Apex class, workflow rule, uh, process builder, uh, process, whatever you're deploying, we're going to build up an artifact saying this is what's going to move. We're then going to deploy the changes from a source to the destination, but we're not going to commit them. And we're going to run all the Apex tests. As you know, you have a code coverage requirement. You have to pass all of your Apex tests uh, to make sure that you're not going to regress your own system. Uh, this is in place for all deployments. And this step, step number three, this is the time-consuming step. This can take uh, up to, I've heard it take up to four hours in some orgs that are large. I love that people put a lot of tests into place. This is good. This is going to make sure your, your system is safe and secure, but it, it does take a lot of time. So that can really gum up a, a process where you're trying to do a multiple system deploy to deploy a new uh, application that doesn't just solely rely on Salesforce, but includes lots of different, uh, different things that are being deployed across your data center. So, so that, that can get people stuck. So we're not letting you do this deploy validate step in the, uh, go ahead, and, uh, in, the, in the, the, the time which is convenient for you. And when that is successful, you have a approved bundle, an approved artifact you're going to be able to deploy at some point in the near future to your destination. So at any point in the next four days, you can do the next step, which is the actual deployment. But now we're going to use Quick Deploy. Quick Deploy says, since, uh, go next, uh, since we have done our tests in the past, I don't have to run the tests again. I'm just going to deploy the changes and commit them without running those tests. We're going to say we trust that the tests are, are going to pass because you haven't made changes in the last three or four days. We're going to trust that you have code coverage because you did in the last time you ran this deploy validate. But now that step, which could take up to four hours, will take a couple minutes at most. So you can now integrate the deployment into your overall deployment process, which includes some database on your end, some other applications you're doing, and, and make the Salesforce deployment step be much shorter and much more reliable during your deployment. So that's quick deploy. We're not taking away the time it takes to run those Apex tests, but we're letting you schedule it for when it's most convenient for you. And the next feature, though, is going to help you with making those tests run faster. It's called test data setup. <clears throat> so here's how we do things today. Uh, the first thing we do is we create a data utility method. So this method circled here, I call it initialize reference data. And I'm going to create 100 accounts, I'm going to create 1,000 contacts, I'm going to create a million tasks. And then I'm going to call that method in each of my individual test methods. So if I've got 15 tests in my test class, I'm calling that initialize 15 times. I'm creating 100 accounts and 1,000 contacts and a million tasks 15 times. As you can imagine, that's not free. That takes a bunch of time. And we're doing the same data creation and teardown every single time. And so in, in an attempt to make things faster, you will see the new Apex test pattern, which is the test setup pattern. So again, I'm going to create the data utility method, but as you're going to see, I'm annotating it as at test setup. What that's going to tell the Apex test executor is run the setup method first, but then I don't have to run it now in each of my individual tests. I run the setup, and then I can run my individual unit tests following that using the same reference data without having to tear it down and build it back up every single time. 
how, how much faster this will make you depends entirely on your tests and how they're set up, but I know that some of the orgs that have the large four-hour test executions uh, will see significant improvements uh, with the test setup feature. So that is the test setup feature to help make your life faster. And speaking of faster, introducing a pilot in Spring 15, Sandstorm, is all about making sandbox copies faster. That looks uh, like the and, sand cloud, Adam. That's the sand cloud. Right, so the, the storm is in the cloud in this particular yeah. case. So uh, to give you an example, one of our pilot customers who uh, has been using this had a 100 gig org that normally took 30 days to refresh a full sandbox because that's a lot of data and there's a lot of transformation that we have to do to that data to make sure that it works just right for all your various integration and training scenarios. And that 30 days was optimized down to just under three days or an 85% reduction in time generating a full sandbox. And this gives us a ton of different options as we start to try to get uh, quicker sandbox copies, improved queuing, uh, and better uh, notifications of the progress of a sandbox copy. So definitely faster. Uh, and then one of the most exciting things we want to tell developers about with the Spring 15 release just announced is Visual Force Mapping. Now this is cool. I'll never forget one of the very first S controls I ever built nine years ago involved a Google Maps integration and I had to roll my own HTML, my own JavaScript. I had to do an enormous amount of uh, lifting within the code because I had to worry about all these things just to be able to do a mashup of things like contacts near a particular account. And what we've done with the Spring 15 release is we've made this incredibly easy so that you can focus on the Visual Force tags and we'll focus on the JavaScripting. So what you'll see now is the inclusion of a new uh, Apex tag called Map. You pass it in a size, a type, most importantly you bind it to a series of um, address fields within an account or say a contact or a lead and then each iteration within that map will be a map marker that you can then position within uh, the overall canvas. So we've now made it very easy for you to focus on Visual Force and we'll handle all the JavaScripting and HTML and rendering on our end. So we're really excited about Visual Force mapping making it easier to do geolocation within Visual Force. All right, so where does this lead us? This leads us all to this great thing that we just introduced at Dreamforce. It was a soft launch called Trailhead. If you'd like to see how uh, these features work and learn more about force.com and how to actually uh, work within the platform, this is a phenomenal place to go to learn everything you need to know about the platform. Uh, you'll see there are different tracks and different trailheads that you can follow, like getting started or introduce, introduction to the visual app development platform where, where you learn more about Visual Force. Uh, it's interactive. You get to earn badges and points. Uh, and it covers both declarative administrative functions as well as programmatic and developer functions. So please check it out. It's at developer.salesforce.com slash trailhead. Very cool way to learn about the platform. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to turn it back over to Mike Erhold, who's going to go ahead and uh, finish up the webinar for us. Yes. Mike. So thanks, everyone, for staying on. Uh, I know we've seen some people that weren't able to get on, but this webinar is being recorded, so yay. Uh, and we love your feedback. Um, I know while Adam and Josh were doing a fantastic job demoing some new stuff, um, let's just go ahead and keep it on your screen, Adam. Oh, all right. Um, since there's only one more slide left. Okay. You got it. That'll make it easier. Sorry about that. Little hiccup. Hey, it's live. Uh, we'd love your feedback on the webinar, so you can go to bit.ly backslash spring15 <laughs> webinar. Let us know what you think. Um, minus a few screen transitions. Hopefully we did pretty well. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go through and we'll do some live Q&A. It looks like we've got about seven minutes for live Q&A. So, of course, you can always tweet us. I will kick it off. I grabbed some questions out of the, the question box. So the, the first one is going to be for Bill and our special guest, Shelly, by the way. Big kudos to Shelly. That was a great demo. Process Builder is going to be awesome. So 
the question is, what is the difference between visual workflow and process builder? Thanks. It's a question that's often asked. So process builder, as I mentioned in the beginning, is built on the Salesforce. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yep. Process Filter is built on the Salesforce platform. One of the things that we leverage is visual workflow. So you can think of Process Builder as a subset of what's in visual workflow. Now, we always get a follow-up question is, when do I use Process Builder? When do I use visual workflow? If you have any complex logic that requires decisions with multiple outcomes, for example, or you need user interactions through screens or forms, that's your key to and trigger to, to go to visual workflow. Um, as we continue to iterate over process builder, we'll add more and more of that capability into it. But for now, that's a good way to think about it. So again, complex logic, so decisions with multiple outcomes, and or you need user interactions through screens or forms, go to, go to visual workflow. Fabulous. Um, and we'll jump over, I'll try and keep it even. So Adam and Josh, the question came in, how many fields will audit field trail be extended to past 20? Uh, great question. Uh, with the field audit trail add-on, I believe the limit goes up automatically to 60 uh, from 20. So the standard offering, you'll just get 20 for up to 18 months per object. Uh, but with field audit trail, it goes up to 60 for up to 10 years. Oh, wow, 10 years. It's a long yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of data. I mean, it's, it's like it's Carl Sagan billions and billions of rows data. Billions. Billions. So next question would be for, for Bill and probably Shelly. Um, if you decide to use Process Builder, will you have to rewrite all of your current workflows in there, or can they run side by side? Okay, great question, and we get that a lot. So think of Process Builder is as the next generation of workflow rules, and by the way, we're also going to be incorporating approvals uh, in the future, so it's the way forward. But your existing workflow rules will continue to run, continue to be supported. What we want to see happen is that anything, you start converting them because it's, honestly, because it's, it's more efficient, you can combine multiple workflow rules into a single process, and then there's more power in Process Builder. So potentially you can get rid of some of the utility Apex triggers that you've written that are, you know, that are costly to maintain um, for things like creating records. Um, and you can do that in the Process Builder, and then it's easier to change and maintain and sort of respond to your business needs. So we're going to let you, we're going to let that migration happen um, at, at everyone's own pace. And we're not going to take away workflow rules for quite a long time. Uh, I think that Process Builder, as we, as we, as Bill mentioned, we're going to keep adding more and more power to it. Uh, it'll just be more appealing to do it in the Process Builder in terms of, of management. But um, all the processes, flows, and workflow rules can continue, and approval processes can continue to operate and and exist uh, all side by side. Uh, but eventually, what we want to do is bring approvals into the Process Builder. And then we're going to connect the process builder to flow so that when you create a process, if you do need to do something like much more complex branching logic or add screens to your process, um, ultimately you'll be able to sort of graduate to flow. And so the one place to go is going to be the process builder and everything will, will go from there. Uh, but, but status quo on everything else in the meantime. Very good. Um, I'll ask myself a question. Ha ha. Uh, so a lot of questions came in about sales path, and uh, I, I didn't point it out, but I should have. Um, sales path is for mobile only, so it works in Salesforce One, uh, and it respects record types, so you can set up multiple sales paths. Paths. There was quite a few questions that came in about that. Okay, Josh, I think you're on the hot seat with this one. So with quick deploy. Uh, with quick deploy within four days, if any controllers do not meet test coverage, will quick deploy still hold true? No, quick deploy is uh, still requires tests to be run uh, as part of the deployment process through the validate step. We have another uh, feature that's been in pilot for an even longer time that we're hoping to make GA in the next release or two, which is fast deploy. I know we have a quick deploy and a fast deploy. They're both faster. There's too many ways to say fast and quick, but this the, the fast deploy lets you say, I want to deploy 
a small bundle of changes, and I only want to run tests that are relevant for that small bundle of changes. Uh, that feature has been uh, available in Pilot for quite some time now, and we're uh, going to make it available, uh, is generally available in the next couple of releases. But that was, I think that's what you'd want for that particular use case. Quick Deploy itself requires that tests are run. What the purpose of Quick Deploy is that the actual deployment itself is quick. The actual say, I want to now deploy, deploy this bundle, it happens fast. The tests still have to run at some point prior to that. Fabulous. Um, so we'll bounce back and forth here and probably get two more questions in. Um, one of them is around process builder and workflow rules. Uh, will process builder replace workflow rules and flows, i.e. visual workflow? Okay, so process builder definitely is not replacing flow. Uh, process builder is really, it's actually built on top of flow, on flow engine functionality, and it's really a subset of what flow can do. So process builder and flow are going to work uh, kind of synchronously, you know, side by side as process builder as the sort of simpler interface, uh, quicker uh, to get things done possibly, but maybe not as complex a use cases as flow and then we're going to connect them so that you can graduate to flow. Um, it, Process Builder will eventually replace workflow rules, uh, but not in the next year or so. So workflow rules will continue to exist. You can continue to make them if there's something there that, um, that a Process Builder or Flow don't give you. Uh, but Process Builder and Flow are the future, and that's where we're adding all the new power and functionality. And we're going to continue to iterate on that. Uh, in every subsequent release. So very exciting times for workflow automation. Neat. Um, a lot of questions came in about duplicate management uh, and the duplicate management tool. Uh, I did mention it uses data.com's engine, but it does not require a data.com license. So it's really cool. We're getting to benefit from the power of data.com, but not, not have a license for data.com. So that one was popular. And last question, we'll go to the newest guy in the group, Josh. I think it'll be Josh that'll answer this. Can I have newest newest to me? How's that sound? Can, can I have multiple at test setup methods? Uh, sometimes I may not need all of the setup data for each test. So the way that and there's a couple other questions around this, so I'll kind of talk about it a little more generally. Uh, you can have more than one test setup method in your uh, in each class. So if each class is treated, uh, today you can run a test class and it runs all the methods in that class. So you can treat that as like a mini test suite, if you will. So the set of methods that you declare in that class will be run first, and if you have more than one, they'll run in random order. But once those are done, once you've run your set of methods, we'll set a rollback point. And then any test method you run after that will roll back to the state of the world at the end of your data setup. So if you modify that reference data, it will roll back to the way it was when you set it up. So each test, they can operate in any order and it wouldn't be any different. So each test is an independent trial. And we roll back to that intermediate rollback point. Uh, if you want to use the same test methods uh, that set up across multiple different classes, the way to do that would be to create utility methods that do some, remember my example, create 100 accounts, create 1,000 contacts. And then you can just call those from the data setup methods in the individual test based on what you actually need. You probably won't need the whole world set up for every test class, but you might want to use some similar data, the same custom settings in some cases, the same accounts in other cases. Uh, so you can share the logic, but each class, main test suite, if it were, has its own data setup method that will be called. Hopefully that clears up a whole bunch of different questions that are out there about uh, modifications. And by the way, at, at the end of the test class, all of the data from the test setup method will also be rolled back like it is today. So there will be no impact on uh, on production data based on tests being run. Fabulous. Uh, we'll put a bow on this webinar. Happy Spring 15, everybody. Thanks for attending.